Now, uh, for our final session, I am pleased to call to the stage a man some call the architect, Carl Rove, uh, the pollster to the stars, Stanley Greenberg, and editorial director of the Atlantic Media Company and senior political analyst at CNN, Ron Brownstein. Gentlemen. Thank you, Steve. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, it is a great pleasure to be here with uh, the single individual of each party who I believe best understands the uh, underlying dynamics of the electorate and the structure of the competition between them. And as they can tell you, I've been trying to gather us for this kind of a conversation for years, so I really appreciate you being here. Let me plunge right in. Well, both of us had a failure of good judgment, didn't we? Yes. Yeah, I know, I know. Um, and you've come, and you've come long ways. You've come long ways to be with us, and we appreciate that as well. So let me jump right in. How would you define your party's coalition today, and what are the core beliefs or attributes that hold it together? Well, uh, the Republican coalition is uh, in a state of flux because uh, it's traditionally been economic conservatives, national defense conservatives, and social conservatives. And then starting about 19, 2009 and 2010, we began to have this sort of yeasty Tea Party element, which is at once socially conservative, culturally middle class bourgeois, mm -hmm. economically conservative but populist, and, uh, and in some instances national defense conservatives, but they've got a difference from the traditional from three boxes. Level. Yeah. And uh, particularly in 2010, they were, you know, sort of the uh, insurgent, and like all new movements, civil rights movement, anti-war movement, Goldwater movement, you know, by God, we gotta have everything, everything today, everything our way, and that's always problematic for a political party. But now, now it's starting to sort out, and I think we frankly are past the point of greatest uh, warfare, uh, but that won't be acknowledged in, except in retrospect in a couple of years. Stan, Democratic coalition today? I think it is de it's defined by the, kind of the big underlying dynamics and trends in the country that go to diversity, multiculturalism, the role of women, tolerance, openness, that growing number of um, majority that are secular, growing majority that are living in unmarried households. And so you have, you have a country um, that particularly gathers in cosmopolitan centers of the, of the country that votes increasingly you know, um, you know, democratic. Um, it's defined against a Republican party that is more evangelical and church going, more libertarian and anti-government. Um, and Carl's had a, a significant part of this. I mean, this, the, the issues we've talked about here, the role of evangelicals in the church mm. and the role of Tea Party, are very much part of a strategy that Carl helped drive, which was build up the energy. There are lots of votes left off the, off the table that we need to build up the energy of the base of the Republican Party. That dynamic is carried it through, and I think he's now yeah. living with the dynamic that he You're shaking your head. I actually was not trying to create a fight here. Right, good. Yeah, yeah, you weren't trying to create a fight. You are just saying things that I was complimenting. I was complimenting uh, on your success you in shaping yeah. the you weren't. Uh, look, uh, I love this appeal to the base. 2004 was all about appealing to the base. That's why we got a quarter more votes in 2004 than we got in 2000. That's why we erased the gender gap. That's why we got 44% of Latinos. They're part of the base, yeah. everybody knows that. Women are the part of the base. That's why we erased the gender gap. I mean, baloney. Uh, this was not, 2004 was not, and this strategy was not about the base. Now look, that was a presidential election. The question is what does a party do mm -hmm. You know, at, at, not just for looking at one election, but what does a party well, do? Let, let's talk and about, not all mm -hmm. of that is determined by a candidate or an office holder. So well, other let, things happen. Well, let's, let's talk about that at, at, at the different structural levels. The presidency, 1968 to 1988, Republicans win the presidency five out of six times, and along the way, you get to 61% with Nixon in 72, 59% with Reagan in 84, 53% with H.W. Bush in 88. Since then, since 92, Democrats have now won the popular vote in five out of six, and no Republican has gotten past the 50.8 that uh, George W. Bush did with your help in 2004. What's changed? The country's becoming less white. And if the country becomes more Latino and more black, until those populations economically rise, you're gonna have, if they fit in their current pattern, then you have a more democratic electorate. But, but it's very hard for, you know, it's a, a big mistake is to sort of look at things as they are now mm -hmm. and draw a straight line. I mean, if you looked at the electorate 1948, for example, you'd say, and you looked at it today, you'd say Barack Obama would be a Republican because Republicans mm -hmm. were getting substantial majorities among 
African Americans in Jackie 1940. Robinson was Jackie a Robinson. I mean, you know, Daddy King was for was for Nixon in 1960. Uh, so, you know, but the country is becoming more Latino, slightly more black, somewhat mm. more Asian American, mm. and then these mm. cultural trends that Stan mentioned. You know, we are slightly more secular, though. Though we got to be careful about overemphasizing that. There's a new kind of religiosity out there. But we're also, we are more likely to be delaying marriage, more single, longer. And that has implications. Stan, what's changed at the presidential mm -hmm. level? Well, the, I mean, the electorate has changed fundamentally at the presidential level. And it, it may even be, if we look at Virginia, it may even begin to translate itself, um, you know, in the non-presidential non level. Um, because you began to see some groups beginning to turn out um, in the off year. Um, in some in shares comparable to the, to the presidential. But the presidential is what's defining us, what's striving us, the, the vision of the president, the coalitions that they've you know, uh, you know, put mm. together. You know, we've gone through a number of movements that have transformed the country. We went through the civil rights movement, the women's rights movement, immigration rights, gay rights. All of those things have shaped our thinking um, in, the, in the country and they are affecting the coalitions. They've played out <clears throat> in, in, the, in the last election in which we now have 242 electoral college states, which have gone Democratic six times mm -hmm. um, in a row, states. not counting Virginia now, not counting Colorado, not counting Florida. And so you're, you're dealing with very profound changes, which makes it very hard for the dominant coalition now, which includes African-Americans, Latinos, unmarried women, college-educated women, that that coalition is a... The, the flip is a, side is yes. the House, though, right? So in that earlier period, Democrats held it all 24 years, from 68 to 92. Now Republicans well, have held it well, 16 out of the last 20. Why has that inverted, even as the presidency has become more favorable to the Democrats? Because this is about values, this is about way of life, and what you have is a, a growth of cosmopolitan centers, as we've seen what happened in Northern Virginia. We've got the growth of cosmopolitan centers in which you get very big Democratic numbers. So you get the Democrats winning in the, in the last election, the uh, more votes than the Republicans in the races for Congress, but not winning a majority too concentrated. of the seats. Too concentrated. I think, look, some of this is gerrymandering, but I, but I think density is like a, a bit, you know, at Shorting. least as important, at least as important Shorting. in driving it. Hmm? Yeah. Sorting. Sorting. Yeah. Yeah. Look, uh, you can read something into every election. You can also read too much into every election. Take a look at the last presidential election. Before we start thinking that this is the model for the future, remember, President Obama is the first president to win re-election with a smaller number of votes then he won election initially, and he's only the second American president to win re-election with a smaller percentage of the vote. The other guy was Andrew Jackson, who had to suffer through, you know, the Tea Party of his era called the, the uh, Anti-Masonic Party. But, but, you know, this was an election in which they ta a tactical, not a strategic victory, in my opinion. But let me ask you this. If you're the Republican Party and you look at this and you say Barack Obama won only 39% of white voters, Mitt Romney won a higher share of white voters than Ronald Reagan did in 1980, Still lost by five yeah, million votes. Yeah. That, on the other hand, has got to be pretty daunting, yeah, look, doesn't it? I mean, it, what it says, well, first of all, the, the, the white turnout is down. I mean, there, there, there should have been 1.6 million additional white voters in 2012 than there were in 2008, but there are fewer. I mean, you know, this goes back to the tactical consideration of the Obama campaign with the, what Messina mm -hmm. called the grand bet. You know, we, we, don't, we can't win on your what you've done, we can't win on your perspective vision, nobody remembers the State of the Union address, we gotta go, we irradiate Romney, we're gonna take $200 million, do it during the summer, and it's the grand bet, because if it doesn't work, by Labor Day we'll have neither time nor resources to make it work. And it worked, it, it, drove, it drove white turnout down, middle class, blue collar, working class voters, particularly in the industrial Midwest. You go look at those counties, for example, around Toledo, and I mean, it's huge turn, uh, drop off in, turnout in working class precincts who said, I can't vote for either one of these guys. Stan, 59% whites vote for Romney in 2012. Obama loses whites by double digits in 2008. 2010, Republicans win a higher share of the white vote in the House election than in any uh, election in the history of polling. And even in Virginia, a candidate as provocative as Cuccinelli wins whites by 20 points over Terry McAuliffe. Why are Democrats struggling so much with white voters at this point? First of all, this is above all a Southern problem and a Appalachian problem and evangelical problem. And if you look at Virginia, you know, where those white votes came from was downstate. We're dealing with, it, it was, these were very Southern votes. If you go to the industrial Midwest in the presidential election, this was a contested election mm -hmm. amongst whites in you know, large parts of the country, the industrial center of the country, this was contested amongst whites. 
Um, it's, you know, whites uh, perform okay for Democrats in California, New England. It's a, this is driven by the South. Is it a and regional problem or a bigger problem? I think it's a bigger problem, but I hope that, I hope that people consider it a regional problem and don't mm -hmm. attack it. Uh, well, what is the core of the problem, you think? Why are Democrats performing you know, so poorly? I, I think it's just, you know, there's, you know, I'm, I'm not certain I can solve their problems. I got enough to, yeah. I got enough right, problems. Let me ask you about your, I'll, problems. I'll ask you about your problem. <laughs> no, well, let's do the, the flip side. I mean, as you talked, to, you pointed out, the country is becoming more diverse. The minority yeah. share of the vote is increasing in every election since 80, except one. Yeah. And in every election since 76, the Democratic nominee, presidential nominee, has won between 78 and 82 percent of the two-party vote among non-white voters, yeah. except for one. And that was George W. Bush in right. 2004, held right. Kerry to 71 percent right. among minorities, one of the reasons he won. So what is the secret sauce? What does it take to do that? And is the party today willing to do the things yeah. it would have to do to improve? Well, I'll answer the last question first that we're going to see. Uh, you know, I, I love the analogy that uh, McConnell used the other day about the shutdown and get kicked twice in the head by a mule. We've been kicked three or four times in the head by a mule. So let's see. But I do, know, I, I do think this. First of all, we don't make the case. There was this uh, sort of eccentric Republican in Kansas City who was very keen on the idea of African-American outreach, and he did a simple study of the 2000 election in, Kansas, in the Kansas metropolitan Kansas City area. He said, okay, let's assume that everybody in the Kansas City area, black and white, saw the same amount of TV ads. Let's assume they read the Kansas mm -hmm. City Star or their local paper the same amount of time. Listen. But they also listen to radio. So let's add up the total number of pro-Democrat, anti-Bush, anti-Republican messages and the pro-Bush, anti-Democrat, pro-Republican messages on radio because radio is fractured by, by race. And so urban radio, mm -hmm. the urban radio format, is largely African-American. And so examine it. There are 16,000 individual ads run on Kansas City. Missouri was a battleground state in 2000. Uh, 16,000 pro-Gore, pro-Democrat, mm. anti-Bush, anti-Republican ads. There were six on the other side. I don't mean 6,000, I mean six. I mean six. Wait, and so we, we gotta, gotta make go. the argument. Stan, do you believe the current Republican coalition will let the party leadership and nominee do the things that might be required to reach out to minorities? No. And they can't, I mean, look, right now there are two, uh, there are two main issues, immigration. And unless the leadership simply says, we're gonna drive this through despite the fact that the overwhelming majority of House Republicans would vote against it. Only 22 House Republicans voted for the uh, Dealing with the Violence Against Women Act. We're dealing with a House Republican Party that uh, defines the base of the Republican Party. This is not a tactical question. This is a party that's been losing ground since it took control in 2010. It is the most unpopular point possible. It's defined by its base who were driving the party. Now, the, I, I think what you have to go to is not more advertising is you have to go through a process of reform that recognizes the scale of the problem. Now, you ha you've had analyses, which I think were on the mark, in terms of the scale of the mm -hmm. problem. But here you have a party that you can't be for dealing with climate change and saying it's caused by humans. You can't be dealing with immigration. And by the way, healthcare reform, over time, you look at what will happen with Latinos. Latinos are the ones who are the main beneficiary of this legislation. And in the states, where they are most concentrated, that you will have governors that are waging a war to keep them from getting insurance. Anyway, what, what, are, the implications, what are the implications of the health care law for 2014 and 2016? Do you believe we will see the next Republican nominee, presidential nominee, run on repeal again? Yeah, let, 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 uh, yeah but yeah. let me go back for yeah. a second on one point I do. Yeah. I, I, you know, there's a character on immigration, there's a reality on immigration. I think, and I'm, a, I'm obviously a pro immigration reform guy, I got beat up about it. Yes, you were. But, I recognize this, there are 148 House districts uh, uh, that are represented by Republican where the Latino population is 8% or less. They, don't, they, they, they have not felt the issue. Mm -hmm. They're starting to feel the issue. And we have leadership that is not gonna do what the President did, pass a comprehensive bill as the Senate did, but appear, approach it serially. And the Chairman of the House Judiciary Committee, Goodlatte, is a very serious legislator. So, you know, the, the, the President had, could, if this was important to him, he could have gotten this issue solved in 2009 or 10 with Democrat-only votes, just like he did the Affordable Care Act. He, it wasn't that high a priority for him. All right, back, we're nearing the finish line, so let's talk about the Affordable Care it, Act look, it, it, and it, its implications it, it, going after forward. After the 2010 election, I sat down with two Democrat pollsters and said, why did this happen? They said, well, deficit, debt, stimulus, poor economy, president style, but the key issue that flipped the independence from Democrat in 08 and 06 to Republican was the Affordable Care Act. 
I think that dynamic is going to be seen again this year in the, and, and if it wasn't, we wouldn't have 17 Democrats led by the chairman of the Democratic Senatorial Campaign Committee trooping down to the White House saying, Mr. President, save us from your... And you do think the next Republican nominee will again run on repeal? I do. I do. And, and what are the implications it's, of that, you think, for 2016? It's one of the reasons why I think it is very unlikely that the Republicans will be competitive presidentially um, coming in, in 2016 and maybe even beyond. When, if you want to look at why Democrats paid a price for health care, is people wanted to ask why did they spend all this time on health care and not address the economy. They thought that he, the president took his eye off the ball on dealing with the economy by being consumed with doing health care. They ran the issue. They made particular gains with seniors um, in that uh, election. They ran on this issue, both presidentially and above all in the Senate races, heavily, heavily running ads on health care and lost virtually every contested Senate race. What vote only 38 percent want to repeal and replace which is their position. Oh, it will repeal. look backward looking. Repeal. They will look like 38. a back, this will become mm -hmm. a litmus test issue. Where, and, they will, and they will look backward so looking going into the next one. I know we're at the finish line, but I think people would be unhappy if I let us get out without asking each of you to handicap your view of the top tier of presidential candidates in each party and a very thumbnail description of their strengths and weaknesses for 2016. Stan? I mean, I mean Hillary Clinton is obviously you know, dominant. I'm assuming she will be the um, the, the, uh, the candidate of the, of the party. I think the main challenge for Democrats <clears throat> is the economy. Because I think underlying everything here, if you look at Virginia, on where Democrats didn't get votes, it was working class votes, working class women, um, unmarried women, actually you know, didn't turn mm. out in big numbers. There, people are looking for this president, the country, to address the economy. I don't think they see either party doing it. They're polarized fighting about other things. And the strongest Republican? Or, or, it would be, or the it would be but it is utterly implausible that a candidate that embraced his his claim to his strength was embracing Obama, and 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 funding Obamacare. It is there is no way that he can emerge from the Republican Party primary process. Carl, a quick a quick take on the 2016 field on each side. Yeah, look, we're, okay, we've got the Plesozoic, the Jurassic, the Mesozoic, <laughs> the Trozoic, and the Brownstone Zoic era yeah. is yet to go yeah. through, ages to go through. So it's a, it's a worthless thing, but, but you know, Hillary yeah, that's what Clinton, we do. We, we, Hillary that's what we journalists as, do. We ask worthless things. Yeah, that's things. right. She's as dominant in 2016 as she was in 2008. Or Walter Mondale was in yeah. 1983. And uh, so, well, I don't know. How about well, on the Republican side? Well, what's, we, what's the basic I, choice? I, I, disagree, I disagree with, with uh, Stan on this. I do think Christie has a way to the nomination. I mean, uh, the, he's, got some, he's got challenges, but we got 10 people out there that are thinking about it. I'm going to do it geographically, moving okay. east to west. Christie, Rubio, Bush, Paul, Kasich, Snyder, Walker, Jendall, Perry, Cruz. That's impressive. And, and uh, I do it alphabetically, yeah. but I think in terms yeah. of maps, yeah. not letters. Mm. Uh, though I guess we could go Bush. And who do you Christie, think are most likely Cruz. to be the finalists? Who do you think are most likely you know, to be I the don't finalists know. before and, we and get the hooks? Look, here's the key. Here's the key thing. 2014 is going to be a test for every one of these guys. The question is. At the end of the year, a year from now, are we looking at them saying, you know what, 2014 was more about others, not themselves, and have they grown? I mean, every one of them's got a certain skill set now. They're about ready to be stretched. And the question is, can, can they rise to it? Do they stagnate or do they grow? And do they do things in 2014 that cause people to say, you know what, this is about something bigger than their own personal ambitions. And it's a, these may sound like simple things. They are really tough tests to pass. Stan, a final word before we go? Um, I look forward to that race. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Thank you. thank you all. Thanks. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank Carl Rove and Stan Greenberg for a great tour. Ladies and gentlemen, please give Carl Rove, Stan Greenberg, and Ron Brownstein a real round of applause. This was great. Thanks, guys. Thank Don't leave yet. Bush. Bush. No. No, <laughs> okay, I just want to say uh, inclusion. It, it, it was a real pleasure spending um, the last two days uh, with so many of you. I'm Steve Clements, Washington editor at large at The Atlantic. Uh, for those of you who hadn't gotten that yet, I want to call the stage my great pal and partner in this, Margaret Carlson. Margaret Carlson is the diva, and I mean in my world, diva is a great thing. Uh, the diva that 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 put all this on, and I just want to say a few words first. I want to thank, uh, it's my job to thank the Atlantic, the Aspen Institute Museum for getting along uh, for three months and moving the ball forward on this um, fifth annual Washington Ideas Forum. And I want to thank our underwriters, CH2M Hill, Comcast NBC Universal, Exxon Mobil, General Motors, Nestle, 
Thomson Reuters and Google, thank you all so much for your running. Margaret, I just want to thank, thank you because tomorrow I won't have to call you or deal any time with you. Ben, there are a lot of you, and we feel like you guys are all family because you've been with us the last couple of days, but Margaret and I have been with each other 10, 15, 20 times a day for the last three months. I will kind of miss you. <laughs> But with that, I want to bring the Washington Ideas Forum to a close, and I want to just thank Margaret Carlson again uh, for everything she did. Thank David Bradley, Walter Isaacson, and Jim Gubb. You guys have a good time, and we'll see you next year. Thank you. <laughs>